Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 14 of Aero 32711. Today we're going to be changing gears and starting to learn how to uh, analyze and design welds. Let's see how it works. So here's a few pictures of different kinds of welds. We can see a fillet weld here, bottom right, another fillet weld right there near the middle. Actually, all of these look like fillet welds in a gal welding. So the first piece of understanding a weld is understanding what the weld call out is. If you're trying to design a weld, you need to be able to communicate what is involved in the weld. And if you're trying to analyze a weld, you need to be able to understand what it is. Actually, we can put quite a bit of information in the weld call out itself. Or more frequently or more commonly, you'll see very little information. There are a few pieces of information you're going to need. The first one is this weld line. This line here is where all the information about the weld is going to occur. We're going to also have a little arrow which is pointing to where the weld is. The arrow tells where the weld is and the line, the horizontal line, has all the information about the weld that we might need. Now, the next piece of information we're always going to have is some value right here. This value here is the weld size. This is going to be a number, like 3 sixteenths of an inch, or 1 quarter inch, or 0 0.25 inch, or something like that, where that is the size of the weld. We'll learn how to identify what that is. So we've got the horizontal line where all the information occurs, the pointer that tells where the weld goes, and then the size of the weld, that H parameter. We use S and H nearly interchangeably. H is a little more common. S is also sometimes used. S can be confusing because we also often will use S for a spacing of welds when they're repeated. Okay. So the next thing is going to be this weld symbol. The weld symbols are shown down here. So if we have let's say two plates that are not joined, that we join with a weld in here, then a square weld would be appropriate. Or maybe a V weld may be appropriate. Or a bevel or a U or a J weld. If we have two pieces of metal like this, the common way to join this would be with a fillet weld, which goes right in here. That's this call out right there. So once we have our information line and our location indicator and our size, the next thing is going to be the weld symbol. And we can place it either above the line or below the line. If it's below the line, it means that, that means H would be down here, that would mean that the weld is on the near side. So when you look at where the arrow points, if the symbol is on and size call out are on the same side as the arrow, that means that the weld is precisely where that arrow is touching. If instead that symbol is on the other side, meaning here, with the H here, that means it's on the far side because the air it's on the opposite side as the arrow. That means far side. So if our call out is down here, it's on the near side. If it's up here, it's on the far side. We've got some other pieces of information. This, often this information here will not be present, but if it is, if this is here, that means, so normally if we call out a weld using this arrow, that means we're going to weld, like for this particular case here, if there's no length information, we're going to assume that weld is as far along those joints of those two plates as possible along the whole length. If there's a length call out here, then we're going to assume that it's actually that long. And if there's another number over here, that's the pitch or the spacing between the welds. That would mean we have a length and a repeat. Okay? Those are the kind of things that we're going to be using. Uh, so we've got... So once again, we have the horizontal line 
where the information goes, the arrow. We have a size and we have a weld callout which is on the side of the line which tells us whether the weld is right where this arrow touches or on the far side. If there, the optional length cut callout is used, like one inch, that means it's a one inch weld. If this optional pitch, like three inches, that would mean those welds occur every three inches. If we have a number down here in parentheses, what that means is that we actually have that many of them. So if we have 1-3 with like a 3 down here, that would mean we have a 1 inch weld, uh, 3 inches spacing between them, and there are 3 of them and no more. Okay, so that's the kind of information we can get about welds. Alright, oh, this last symbol here, this is the all around symbol. That means that the weld goes all around whatever uh, feature it is. We'll see how that plays out on some following slides. Alright, so if we have a butt weld, this would mean we've got a, a weld that's a size H. It's a butt weld and it's on the near side of here. Now, if there's no information about the depth of the weld, then we're going to assume it's the full thickness. There also can be depth information like shown here. This is H deep that's the size of the weld. So if that weld size is the same as the plate thickness, that means it's all the way through. If it's smaller than the plate thickness, that means it didn't go through. This stuff that looks on top, this stuff that's uh, this extra part of the weld here, this is called reinforcement. A lot of times when we weld, there's going to be residue that's left over, and that's called reinforcement. It actually serves to slightly increase the strength of static welds, although we never take account of that. It serves to decrease the strength of fatigue, the fatigue life. So when you have a fatigue application, we'll often grind that off. Okay, it's called reinforcement. All right. So this call out on the left means that there's a fillet weld on the near side of the air, which means that that fillet weld occurs on the near side as you see in the second picture. So this call out says it's dimension H and it's a fillet weld and it occurs on the near side of the arrow. That means it's nestled right there. And both these little horizontal and vertical dimensions of this weld are H. Okay. We already said all that. Got that? Okay. Here's some more. If we take a look at this first call out up here, We see up here, we see this is a near side fillet weld. The weld goes here. Now, this isn't the shape of the weld, but this is where it goes. This means it's a far side fillet weld. That could mean down here or over here. Obviously, down here makes no sense because there's nothing to weld there, which means it's over here to the right as shown there. So what we find is we have to be careful. Sometimes just using a far side simple is sufficient. Other times it may be confusing, like if there were two joints that were possible. What this symbol here means, you can see it's on both the near side and the far side. That means we've got back-to-back -back welds on both the near side and the far side of the structure. All around callouts, for example, if we have this post attached, you can see this callout here says it's a weld. We don't have the rest of the information of the weld, so we don't know if it was near or far side, but it doesn't matter because it's an all around weld. Usually we're only going to see one number, that 5 16 kind of thing like this lower one, which means both dimensions of that weld are 5 16 If we have a dual number there, that would mean that those two legs are not the same height. For example, this one. This is kind of frowned upon, and if you ever encounter one like this, we will just assume that the weld dimension is the smaller of the two dimensions. Down here at the bottom again, we see a quarter inch fillet weld on the far side, and we see it's only six inches long. Now you'll notice there's no information about where that's located. Is it in the middle, at the end? That leaves it all up to the imagination of the welder himself or herself. So it's important to be clear if for anything that matters. This is a back-to-back -back five millimeter weld, fillet weld. This call out down here, here's another little interesting thing. Now the size is not shown. It does have a size, it's just not shown. 
What we see here is this weld occurs on both the near and the far side. We see that it starts out on the far side and then it comes to the near side. We see that those welds are 60 millimeters long and they're spaced at 200 millimeters. What that means is the first weld is right where it's shown except it's on the far side of the plate, out of view. It's 60 millimeters long and then 200 millimeters later we have another 60 millimeter weld but this time it's on the near side. The reason we know and so on. The reason we know this is because those two symbols are not right on top of each other, they're staggered. And so that's how we read that kind of weld. Here's another all around call out. We see a five millimeter weld that goes all the way around. Okay. All right. Now what these do is show some other things. This shows there's more information we can say. We can say, hey, look, it's a fillet weld and it's flat. We better make it flat when you weld it or you're going to machine it flat or grind it flat or chip it flat. I don't know why you'd want to be chipping on a weld. That seems like it's going to introduce all kinds of fatigue risers, but that was what that means. There are a number of other callouts here where we can see like a half inch weld. This is a V weld. And if the plate is a half inch, then it's a through weld. But if we have a half inch V weld in a one inch plate, then obviously that doesn't go all the way through. That's actually an accident waiting to happen. It introduces secondary effects, which are going to be difficult to capture appropriately with analysis and is likely to fail that joint. There's a number of other little details here that we're not going to be required to understand in this class. This slide here talks about what acceptable and unacceptable welds look like. We're actually not going to do much with this either, but basically if you have a weld size call out, your weld needs to be filling that completely or more, not less. That's what that basically means. Okay? All right. Now, if we start looking at the welds, let's take a look at this picture right here. So what we have is three plates. You can see we've got this plate and it's attached to these other two plates. These plates are sitting here and then somebody comes and welds them together. Now, if we take this part right here, let's just draw a section cut right through here and let's remove all of this from this plate and bring it down here. That means we've got this plate, we've got the start of this weld, but then we cut right through the weld. Now this is no longer attached to the plate. If this was 2F going this way, that means we've got F and F, right? That means we've got F here. That means the reaction through here is going to be F horizontal. And if we shift the line of action, there's going to be a moment. But what we're going to do is turn that into a parallel and a perpendicular component so we can analyze the normal and shear stresses. If we do that, we can calculate what is the normal component of force and what is the uh, shear component of force. And we do that through trig. Now, not only is the force transforming due to that cut, but also the area is transforming. And so when we write the stress, we end up with the normal stress and the shear stress given by these equations. What these equa and if you wanted to know what the maximum is, you could use von Mises, which is shown down here. Now, if we take a look at this, let's look at this again. I'm going to go ahead and erase what's on this slide, and then we're going to focus on this cut a little closer. Okay? So what we're going to do here, imagine then we've got this weld here, right? We're going to have this cut here, and let's make this cut here, and let's just focus on that fillet weld itself. It's kind of like down here, what we're going to do is take that fillet weld, oops, take that fillet weld, and we're going to look at the forces here and here, the stresses, okay? That's what we're seeing over here. So here's the fillet weld, and we see, now this looks like it's just putting a normal stress, but because of the eccentricity, it's got a normal stress and a moment, and that's going to end up causing a stress distribution, which looks kind of like this, a normal stress distribution. And the shear stress distribution is basically zero, but it actually is something just off zero, which is given by that picture. Okay. Now, if we take a look at this section cut through this part of it, we see now this is going to give a shear like this, right? We're going to have shear reacting, and we're also going to have a moment due to this, which is pulling that off. So the shear reaction, here's our shear distribution. And this is our moment reaction. It's like a pure moment. A pure moment would often be like something like this, but we see it's nonlinear. Okay? 
That's what these equations give you. Now, if we had taken a section cut, let's look at our weld again. Let's look at the weld itself. This is just the weld. If we have instead drawn a section cut here, we can look at the normal and the shear stresses on that weld. And on that plane, that's what's shown over here. And we see that the normal stress distribution looks like this. And the shear stress distribution looks like that. And the normal stress in the other direction looks like this. So that's what the stress distributions look like. So we see we get that from trig and we see it's rather complicated distribution of stress. Some of you are already starting to pucker up and getting worried. But actually when we go out and we test these kinds of welds, we, we meaning industry basically, are unable to match. So even though we have this trigonometric solution given by all this crap, when we go and test it, we're unable to verify this analytical distribution of stress. Whenever something like that happens, it means you've gotten too complicated for reality and your extra complexity is a waste of time. So what we're going to do is toss all of this trig out and analyze the welds in a different manner. Got that? We're basically going to turn this into like a single stress, a normal stress or a shear stress. And that's how we're going to analyze welds. So we're going to toss out this entire slide and everything we learned here and move on to look at how this works if I can get this crap turned off. Okay. So we said that. And so instead of using the approach from the last slide, we're going to use these two relations here. We're going to say if it's a normal stress is dominant, P over A is our stress. And if it's a shear stress, it's going to P over A. The shear stress, though, the shear area is going to be a little trickier to compute. Now, if we have a butt weld like this, we see that the area, we can just draw a section cut through this puppy. And we see that the normal area it's just going to be this area right here. It's just the thickness of the plate and the width of the plate, right? Same thing here. Draw a section cut through here. It's just the shear area is just the thickness times the width of the plate, okay? So for butt welds, we're basically going to use the whole area of the weld, all right? Now, if we have a fillet weld, we're going to do something different. Remember, we have these two dimensions, and we saw that the stress distribution due to trig is complex. So a basic fill fillet weld, if we pull this out, we've got a weld like this. And that's this weld right here. And we know the stress distribution is complex here and complex here. Instead of doing that, what we're going to do is just make a section cut through here. And we're going to analyze this as if all of the force causes only a shear stress. And it's the shear stress P over A. So if we have shear on this, because let's say this plate is like this, or if this plate is loaded like this, both of those would cause shear on that plane. It's causing other things also. It's like taking this little area right here. What we're going to do is take this dimension here, and that's H, right? Uh, or actually, it's not H. It's something similar to H. Hold on just a second. And we're going to take the length of that weld. So if our weld callout, were uh, h, then actually this dimension is h and this dimension is h. Now you got to be careful because we're kind of overusing this h terminology. We used it for this, but we also are going to use it for this minimum. What we're going to do is take this. You'll see that this dimension is larger than this dimension. In fact, this through here is the minimum dimension. So if we have a, uh, a weld that's symmetric, which means both of these legs are the same, then this dimension here is going to be 0.707H. So if our weld size is H, a fillet weld will have an area of 0.707H times the length of the weld, the length this way. That's the area we're going to use, and we're going to pretend it's just P over A kind of stress. That is a great simplification. So if we look at this weld up here, in the top here, we see we have a weld of that length there, and it has dimension. So the area of this is going to be 0.707H times 
L and it's got a little squiggly L, right? And what that means is looking again at that, let's look at that three dimensional weld. If the weld goes like this and it's say five inches long, what that means is we're calculating the area of this inclined plane here. Its dimension is five times whatever the H is, but that dimension is 0.707H. So let's write that this way, 707H, five times 0.707H, that's our area. We're gonna actually assume though, even though this has, so the centroid of this will be somewhere halfway here, but what we're gonna do with welds is we're gonna assume that all of the weld occurs magically right at this little point of intersection. So anytime we have a fillet weld, we're gonna pretend it only exists right there at the corner and we're going to assume that it has an infinitesimal area. The shear area is going to be 0.707H times the length of that weld. And we're going to assume its location. So when we start categorizing welds and listing them in our table, one, two, three, we're going to put in the H dimension of the weld and the length of the weld. And we're always going to assume its X and Y coordinates or the coordinates of this little corner. Okay, that's an important simplification that makes our job a lot easier. And it's followed universally in industry. Okay, so if we take a look at this first picture, we see we have, if this is force F, then actually we've got F over two and F over two. So that means the shear stress is gonna be F over two. And then we're gonna have our weld is gonna be 0.707H times L, which in this case is 0.05 meters. If we have this loading, we can see half of our shear is taken out at each weld. And once again, it's going to be, that means our stress will be F over 2 over 0.707H times the length of that weld. If we have this one here, we see our area is going to be 0.707H times the length, which is going to be this plus this plus this plus this, that length. The length of the weld. That's our shear area. Our stress is just going to be P over that. That's a gross simplification. That's is going to give us numbers that match testing, roughly. Now, the next idea is to ident identify when we have welds loaded in plane or out of plane. So let's say we have two sheets of paper welded together like this. If we have a loading that causes it, all of the stresses to occur in the plane like this, that's called an in-plane weld. If we have stresses that pry that off, causing out of plane, see this pulling tension over here, pulling out of plane stresses, that's called, called out of plane weld. So if we have an in-plane weld, like in this case, we have a bar load attached to another bar, the loads are all in the same plane as all welds, that's called an in-plane weld. See that? We can see we have an H weld all around, which means it's going along this upper surface, on the near side, along here, along here, and then actually the only place it can be is on the on the uh, other side of this one here. See that? That's how that would work for this guy. Okay, here's our basic approach. This is very close. It's analogous to what we did for fasteners. We're gonna actually transform our loading to a axial load to forces and moments at the centroid of the weld pattern just like with fastener. So first we have to find the properties of the weld. We need a centroid X and Y coordinate. We need the J, the torsional constant of that. And then we need to transform our loading to the centroid of that weld pattern. And then we're going to plug into our equations that are similar to our equations for fasteners and calculate the stress in each weld. Now the trick here is with fasteners, when we calculated the stresses, we just needed to calculate the stress at the center of each fastener. That was sufficient. In this case, since welds are long, we're going to have different X and Y coordinates for different parts of the weld. We're going to actually have to plug in the point, the coordinates of any point we want to know the stresses, which means we're going to go to all the extreme five points of the weld. For example, in this particular case, we have a point right here might be critical, right here might be critical, right here might be critical, and right here might be critical. Those are the four extremes we're gonna to need to plug. If we have experience to identify quickly which one is critical, we can just do it once. But if we don't, we need to check all points to make sure that we have found the critical spot. So let's see how that works. 
We're going to calculate our weld section properties. We're going to take the sum of the areas times the x's of those welds. So we have in this case four welds. We're going to need the area of that weld. Let's take, uh, which means in this particular case for the first weld, let's go ahead and draw this down here. If we say this is weld number one, then we're going to have, we're going to call that weld number one. We have the area. Let's go ahead and just write our dimensions. We have H and we have L. The H of this is this call out here. We just write that number here. The length is going to be this dimension here. We put that right there. Okay. The X bar of that is going to be halfway. So whatever this is to so that W over two and the height of that weld or the, excuse me, the Y bar of that is at zero. If this is our X and that's our Y, then that's at zero. Okay. When we come to weld two, let's call this weld two, we see the X coordinate is actually uh, our H. We've got an H and we've got a W. In this case, our W is Y is this Y, uh, this Y dimension, the vertical height. This is WX. The Y bar of that, the X bar of that is going to be the X bar of that weld is right here, right? So actually it's WX of weld number one right? Because this dimension and the height of that is going to be WY of weld number two over two. And then number three is going to be once again at this W over two and at this vertical dimension here. And this last one is at zero and the vertical location. Once we have that, we see that the area of the weld, that's just going to be 0.707 if these are fillet welds, H times L. So you populate this column. And then from then on, we're doing our AXI and our AYI and everything else is the same. Okay. We're going to see that shortly. So, so we got our X bar this way. Now we can write it this way. If we identify the width of the weld and the height of a the weld, then WX for weld number one is just this horizontal dimension here. WY of weld number one is the 0.707H and the X bar is going to be half of that WX value. Okay, and so on. For the second weld, our, our width dimension was 0.707H and our height dimension was just the, ver the vertical height of that thing. We're going to do, we can also write it this way. We can say, okay, we can just say that this is going to be 0.707HL times its X bar location. That's another way, which if all welds are the same, have the same H, can simplify like this. For the Y, we're going to get the same kind of numbers. And then our area then becomes our width times our height, which is our sum of the 0.707 HLs. Okay. Our J now, we've got two components. We've got this weld, which has an area and it's not located at the centroid. So it's going to be the sum of the AR squared values. And the weld has rotational properties. For example, if we have a horizontal weld, then it has properties about this axis and this horizontal axis. Now about the horizontal axis is just 1 12th width dimension times 0.707H cube dimension. That number is really small. We're going to find out we can neglect it. We also have rotation about the other axis, which is 1 12th 0.707H times this length dimension cube. That's going to be a big number. Okay. So actually this is our equation here. And that simplifies to, if we plug everything in, we can write it this way, which we can write it this way. We, you'll notice we broke up this R component into the X minus X bar squared and the Y minus Y bar squared. And that means we can simplify it writing it either as width and height dimensions, or we can do it with a 0.707 HL kind of dimensions. Now, when we get to this point, we're going to notice that we have L cubed, that's a big term. When we have H cubed, that's a tiny term. So we can neglect that. We don't have to, but we can. If you're writing an Excel spreadsheet, you can easily include this. If you're not, you can, uh, if you're doing it you can, by hand, you can ignore it. Okay. We then need to calculate our loads of the CG, the weld pattern, in the same manner that we did for fasteners. And then we can calculate our shear stress. Once again, we're going to look for the horizontal and vertical component. You can just plug into this equation, which will give you the horizontal component, this equation, which gives you the vertical component. 
and this equation, which gives you the shear stress. And once again, notice when we convert our moment, we're using the right-hand rule for all these stresses. Okay. So if we have a weld loaded out of plane, we're going to follow a similar thing, but now we're going to be getting bending properties about another axis. So our section property is going to be given like this, and our our uh, torsional constant is going to be given by this. Now we'll notice here that the bending, the I about this axis is the same as the J about this plane. The bending about this axis is the same as the J about this plane, as you can see here. Move our load and calculate our stresses. Okay, so one of the things you're going to need to understand is be able to plug this in so you're calculating the stresses correctly, but you also need to be able to identify whether we have an in-plane or out-of-plane welder, else you'll be getting incorrect results. So if we look at this one, we see that this is an in-plane weld. We're going to transform this force to the centroid of the weld pattern, which is going to give us a vertical force and a moment, and the moment is going to cause stresses like this, and the vertical component is going to cause stresses like this, and the total stress is going to be the summation of those and the resultant of the summation of those. See how that works? And we're going to do this all analytically. This is how that would look. Here's another example. Now you'll notice this force is causing stresses that are perpendicular to the plane. It's also causing shear stresses, but it's causing perpendicular stresses as well. Because of that, we're going to call that an out-of-plane weld and we're going to calculate the section properties of this base. So we transform our loads to there. It's got a moment and a force, and the moment causes those forces, the force causes those forces and stresses, and then we put them together into the resultants. Okay? If we have a weld like this, you don't need all that analysis. We can see by symmetry, this is just the force per weld is just F over 2, and we would just have the h dimension, right, 0.707h times the length. So it's f over 2 over 707h. If we have one like this, we see, oh, it looks like this is a in-plane weld. Now, it looks like a three-dimensional structure, but you'll notice that the forces are causing stresses in the plane, which means you can just collapse these two on each other, or else what you can do is just take the properties of one set of welds and then just double it or calculate both of these and just ignore this dimension through the thickness, all those will give you the correct solution. This guy, you'll notice this force is causing out-of-plane stresses, so this would be causing a, be an out-of-plane weld. If we have a little example like this, here's two plates fastened together with a transverse load applied. We see that we have an all-around fillet weld on the near side. We construct a table put in, we got four welds here. We've got the height of each weld. We've got the length of each weld. We've got, a, uh, this is using a slightly different approach where I put in the length in the X direction, the length in the Y direction, and then use a 707H in there. Gives you the same results. What I recommend is making a table of properties. You'll notice here, a table of properties that includes all of these columns out to until you get J all of that. You're going to get your properties out of that and then you can go transform your moment to the CG and then apply into the formulas for tau x and tau y and the tau resultant by hand. Don't try and do this. This is my own fancy nomenclature for identifying different points on the weld. Don't try and do your stresses in the table. It's going to be too complicated. Uh, not too complicated for you, but it's more than you're ready for, for all of you. So what you want to do is use the table out to get J. Once you have J, you're then going to systematically look. We look at this weld and say, okay, we'll check the stress at this point, the stress at this point, the stress at this point, and the stress at this point. Whichever one is largest is the critical stress. That's what you're going to write your margin of safety on. Later, you may look at this and say, wait a minute, this is giving us a force like this and a moment like this. Therefore, this is probably going to be critical in either this point here or this point here and just check one of or both of those. But until you have that judgment, I would check all four points. Okay. Here's another example. 
Here we have a plate welded to a wall with back-to-back -back welds, like a snake bite weld. We can see that this force is causing stresses out of plane. That's called an out of plane weld. And we can construct our table like this. We're going to construct it from here out till we get J. And actually, what we're using for an out of plane weld is we're calling I, but you'll notice the I is just a combination of the I, uh, J is just a combination of the I's and the other two axes. Um, so this you can just, uh, for your purposes, you don't need this I, X, and I, Y. You can just calculate the I using the equation that I gave you, and that will be fine. You're not going to do it this way. You're just going to plug into the equation. Okay? So if we have a three-dimensional weld, you're not going to be required to understand to use to apply three-dimensional welds. But for, so if you get out there in industry... You're going to find, we're going to follow the same approach, but now we have three planes. We have torsion about in this plane, torsion in this plane, and torsion in this plane. We have three planes. So we have three J's, three potential moments, three X bar, Y bar, Z bars. We're going to construct our table and calculate our X, Y, and Z bars as before. We're going to now calculate three J's as shown here. Some of these terms will be negligible. We'll move our loads to the center of the fastener pattern, and then we'll apply these equations to calculate the stresses. Once again, this is following a right-hand rule for all sign convention, with the resultant being the root mean squared. Okay, that's how you do that. If you want to see an example of that, we can go and apply a three-dimensional analysis on this two-dimensional weld. It come, plays out like this, and like that. And here's a little industry example. This was a uh, job I worked with a client where we had a life port uh, life support system had a lot of welded parts. For example, it had a little fitting like this that was welded on kind of like this. It has these little pansy welds. Now this was kind of poorly designed. It was welded almost to fail. But this is uh, could have been collapsed to analyze like a 2D weld, but it's actually a three-dimensional weld. If you applied a three-dimensional weld to this, we just identify our coordinate system. You can see the XYZ coordinates on the lower left front. And then uh, this is the nomenclature I use to identify which parts of the weld I'm going to check. This goes and gets properties. The way you guys would do this was con would be to construct this entire table to calculate the three I's or J's and to calculate your moments. And then you would go and plug into the equations to calculate your stresses. This does all that analytically. And uh, this is a little excerpt from my analysis. My client, the analyst, didn't know how to do this, even though a couple of them had been in my class. So I did it for them. Anyway, it's kind of an educational thing. So once again, you're going to need to be able to calculate two-dimensional welds. You're going to need to be able to identify whether it's in plane or out of plane. And you're going to need to be able to apply that for two-dimensional welds, not for three-dimensional welds. Okay? So once again, we need to be able to identify what the weld is from the weld callout. Either write the weld callout for a weld we find or be able to understand what the weld is for uh, what the weld callout is. We're going to be able to need to be able to calculate properties for in-plane and out-of-plane welds, which means we've identified which one those is, which ones those are, whether they're. So we're going to look at our weld. Once we understand what the weld pattern looks like, we're going to say, is this an in-plane or out-of-plane weld? We're then going to use the appropriate method for analyzing that. We're going to calculate our properties and then calculate the stresses in the weld following that procedure. Next time we'll learn about a simplified method, and then we'll learn how to evaluate the strength against the allowables and the fatigue. Got it? Enjoy.